Right, good morning, everybody. Have I got sound? Yes, I have. That's marvellous. Louder? Louder, I'll get closer. Oh, that's better. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming today to the Exist event. Our Exist event is our second event of the year. Um, it's Circular Economy, Creating a Sustainable Future. Um, my name's Sarah Brooks. I'm on the Exist committee um, for, for, for the Chamber, um, for the Exeter Initiative for Science and Technology. Um, I work currently at DigiLab, DigiLab Solutions on the key in Exeter, so we're very much a local business. We grew out, we were born out of the university, so we took IP from the uni, um, commercialised it, made it into a business. Um, and our main aim of doing that, the reason that, that we did that, was to help achieve sustainability really fast. That's what we do in, um, on a tech platform. Um, so obviously I also know about how the university works. I worked there for seven years, so um, research, taking that through sort of RD and, and, and into innovation. I'm absolutely not an expert in anything at all, so, um, but I am re really, really curious, and this is why I ended up working at the university. I'm curious about everything. I'm really keen to understand about circular economy because it's one of the things that I didn't work in particularly at the uni, so um, I find that really, really exciting to understand that. I think today we will go from big picture concepts and horizon scanning through to the fundamental research, um, development and then innovation with the university. Um, and then actual application in the field um, for Exeter businesses. And this is actually from experts, not like me, um, who can actually explain the hows, the whys and the wherefores of, of circular economy and how we can, what we can do about it. Um, about Exist, which um, they're a subgroup of the Exeter Chamber. We're a STEM-focused group. Um, we showcase the innovative areas of expertise that we have in, the, in Exeter and the wider region. Um, our ultimate goal is to make Exeter an even better place to do business for, um, for STEM companies and organisations, and obviously the knock-on effect of that into other businesses as well. Um, our group hosts uh, topic-focused events centred around science, technology and innovation for the business community. It's obviously, it can be wider than Exeter as well. We have guests today, certainly guest speakers today from, from other parts of the UK as well, so we're trying to kind of bring a wide base of, of, of expertise in. Um, if you'd like to join the Chamber, please do. Um, you'll automatically get access to everything that is exist, uh, raises the profile of your business, um, you hear about the cutting edge news and opportunities, connect with like-minded businesses and organisation, you get a 50% discount to, extend, uh, to attend events like this today, um, and there's all sorts of other benefits as well. A um, little bit of housekeeping quickly, if there's a fire, that door there, and stand out there, um, I'm told. Um, Lou's, as you've probably worked out already, if you go back towards the front door and then turn left, they're just around the corner there. Um, after the talks, we'll have more tea and coffee, so there'll be more chance to network if you want to. Um, obviously, I realise you know, you've taken some time out of your, your, your precious day. I know what that feels like, so if you do have to go, then feel free. But do feel free to contact us to get in touch with other people if you wish to. Um, for questions, when we get to question time later after each speaker, could you wait, please, until the mic's actually got to you? And Katie at the back is going to take the mic around to everybody. Um, we're on live stream today, so that, that mic will... Um, it, we, we need you on the mic so that it picks up on the live stream and, and for later um, for, for talking. Right, so moving on, I am going to introduce Debbie Ward, who is... Actually, I need to work out our slides as well. <laughs> so that was me. I'm really used to just talking, <laughs> not doing anything with slides. So you'll have to excuse me if I, um, if I don't quite manage to do the slides properly. Um, so Debbie Ward, she is the director of Circlo Consult. Um, she spelt, spent a good proportion of her career in marketing and business development in the built environment sector. Um, her interest in sustainability and in more recent years, circular economy has prompted her, prompted her to, uh, to do a PG cert in innovation enterprise in the circular economy. Um, she's had increased involvement with the CE agenda um, over several years um, through both her work and being an organiser of the local Circular Economy Club chapter. Um, and from that, Debbie um, established uh, Circular Consult to focus on the circular economy related training, education and advisory projects, um, including delivery of a carbon literacy and circular economy in construction course. Debbie's keen interest in CE in construction then led her to become a director of the rebuild site CIC and she currently works part-time with Entress at the University of Wolverhampton, supporting SMEs to adopt a sustainable and circular strategies. Um, and I think she's going to do our horizon setting and um, understanding of the concepts of, of CE, um, just to, to get us started, get sort of a real group understanding of, of where, we, where we begin, and then we'll move on into the um, other speakers later. So, Alex, can I hand over to Debbie now? Brilliant. 
So good morning, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can, Debbie. I don't know if you can hear me. <laughs> right. Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, okay, so thank you for that um, great introduction that's given a bit of an overview as to, to who I am. Um, and thank you to Exeter Chamber for asking me to speak today. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what the circular economy is, um, a few different um, case study examples across different sectors, um, and also a little bit about some circular economy related policies. So why do we need to be more circular? Uh, this is a quote from Inga Anderson, the Exec Director of the United Nations Environment Programme. The core driver of the triple planetary crisis, climate, biodiversity and nature loss and waste and pollution is unsustainable consumption and production. And this um, graphic here is from an Ellen MacArthur Foundation um, report from a few years ago now, actually, that quite clearly demonstrates that 55% of our carbon emissions globally are directly energy related, but 45% of them are related to the stuff that we use and consume. So our food, clothes, cars, buildings. So switching to renewable energy does play a really important role in addressing climate change, but it's not enough in itself. Um, in order to target some climate, it's critical that we transform how we design, make and use products and foods, let's say cars, buildings and, and other consumables. So there's lots of different opinions. Um, I've just put some um, a few there of leading organisations um, that net zero carbon possible without a circular economy example that I just um, said there in the previous slide about 55% um, of our emissions being directly energy related but the 45% being on how we um, make things and use them and dispose of them. There's lots of different definitions of what a circular economy is. Um, there is a plethora of different articles and reports um, on the circular economy. Um, this this is one particular definite I think is quite clear, um, again from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. It's a new way to design, make and use things within planetary boundaries. Shifting the system involves everyone and everything, businesses, governments and individuals, our cities, our products and our jobs. By designing out waste and pollution, products and materials in use and regenerating natural systems, we can reinvent anything. For any of you who have done a little bit of reading around the circular economy, this butterfly diagram might be a familiar one. Um, it can look a bit daunting um, to start off with, but basically um, it's just demonstrating the technical cycle and the um, biological cycle um, of the circular economy. Um, and the, the biological side shows how resources should be cascaded through the cycle, while the technical side materials to retain and create value. Um, so an example on the technical cycle might be a mobile phone um, with minerals and metals that keep looping within the system. The biological cycle um, might be something perhaps like um, uh, a table that's made from wood um, that can be um, kept in use for as long as possible and repaired similarly to the, the technical cycle. But ultimately, um, if you're using non-toxic materials within that product, it means that it can go back to the earth, be composted and be part of the regenerative system. A slightly more um, basic example one I like to use, um, which shows the four principles of a circular economy. Um, principle one is to remove waste and pollution by design from the outset. 80% of environmental acts are determined at the design stage. So it's really important to shift our mindset to look at the issue early on, right at the very beginning, um, rather than just looking at what we call end of pipe, um, the, the waste issue, um, at the end of our processes. The second principle is keeping materials and products in use at their highest value for as long as possible. Um, the third is natural systems. Um, in nature, there's not really any such thing as waste. All byproducts are used as a resource or food, and we need to think about designing our system generative to do the same. And then the fourth principle um, being that the circular economy is powered by renewable energy. Going back to that second principle, um, looking at the, the three different um, kind of bubbles there. So historically, um, very much of a linear economy where we take stuff out the ground, 
make stuff with it, use it and throw it away. We are more now in sort of a recycling economy um, where we do do a little bit of looping between the make and the use, maybe um, some motions are looking at reuse, so looking at instrument remanufacturing, um, and we do do a reasonable amount of recycling, but then still a lot of um, materials and resources are wasted. But we really need to shift into a, a circular economy where there's a lot more of that looping. And again, thinking of the butterfly diagram, that's all of those technical and biological looping. Um, again, where we're designing our products to be able to, to loop um, and reuse and repair and maintain, refurbish, and then ultimately end of life, be able to disassemble it and recycle it. So as you probably gathered from the last couple of slides, design is paramount to achieving a circular economy, designing for long life, designing for flexibility and adaptability, designing for maintenance and repair, and designing for disassembly, not only um, through the product's life, um, making that easy to repair and refurbish and remanufacture, but obviously then also at end of life when the product's taken apart for components to be reused or recycled. So taking a quick look at circular economy business models, um, there's, there's a number of different examples across each of these. Um, I'm sure you'll be familiar with some of them. Um, Biome is an example in the um, built environment of circular inputs and supplies. Um, it's actually products made out of uh, mycelium mushroom roots. Um, they are producing a um, number of different products, including building insulation. Um, examples of products as a service are um, Philips, their Signify product range, um, where you're actually paying for the looks, you're paying for the lighting rather than so the service of light rather than actually the light fitting. Um, so Philips will retain ownership um, of the light fitting and um, should it need repairing or should you decide you want different light fitting, they'll come um, and do that as part of the, the service model. Carbon tunnel vision image um, in my presentations because I think it's really important um, that whilst um, net zero carbon and reducing our carbon emissions is obviously very, very important and something that we shouldn't lose sight of with everything else that, that we have to consider in our in our businesses. There are also a number of other um, issues that we need to, to look at as part of our, our decision making. And I kind of um, often go back to the, the traditional three pillars of sustainability, the little kind of triangle at the top and the three pillars supporting it underneath of economic, social and environmental. Um, and, and it's important to balance all of those. And, and within that, um, equally not get too focused purely on carbon. You've got your resource scarcity, you've got your biodiversity loss, you've got your water crisis and air pollution. Um, so just to add a layer of complexity, not just looking at carbon, we need to be looking at the bigger picture and keep the bigger picture in mind. Um, and as part of that, particularly picking up on the social element, um, the circular economy, if it's done at a systems level, if it's done holistically, isn't just about the environment and the economy. It also is about society as well. Um, and circularity gives us the tools to tackle climate change and biodiversity loss together, whilst also addressing important social needs. And from a framing perspective, um, if sometimes when you're perhaps talking about circularity within your business, um, people don't still quite quite get it. You know, you're talking about this looping, what does that mean? Um, I think it's useful to think about, about it in terms of framing circularity um, as a reinvention of the waste hierarchy, showing how we need to move away from disposal to refocus on prevention and reuse. Um, and again, looking at all of those those looping um, elements of the butterfly diagram and the more simplified one that I use, it's all the re's um, that are listed there as part of the waste hierarchy. So really quickly, just moving through um, some examples. Um, I know you're going to get a copy of these slides so you can read them in your own time um, afterwards. Um, but a built environment example, um, looking at steel, um, both as a material and a structural system already has excellent circular economy credentials and we need to make sure that we're reusing steel wherever possible um, rather than just using recycled steel. This uh, is um, an example of an engineer that was originally 42, dismantled and rebuilt in Rotterdam in 1952 and then in 2015 became a bus terminal in Schiphol. Oops. 
Is that moving forward or have I skipped two now? Um, my slides aren't moving forward. There we go. Apologies if more than one moves forward now. Um, so this building um, is in Holland. Um, it's Trados Bank headquarters designed for deconstruction made during using timber with tens of thousands of screws. Whether it's ever completely um, deconstructed and built again, this thing is who knows. But at end of life, those different components can be taken down and reused potentially in other buildings and for other uses. Next slide, please. Um, so redevelopment, again, looking at refusing um, to, to build anything new. Um, this is actually using 70% of the original building as a refurbishment. Next slide, please. In the food sector, um, when you go in the supermarket, you go around your local deli, who sees crust sandwiches? You don't see crust sandwiches. Where do all those crusts go? Um, toast beer, um, recognize this, um, that a lot of surplus bread um, doesn't stay within the human consumption cycle. It goes up into animal food or further down the chain. Um, so they actually reuse um, surplus bread to make beer. What a fantastic um, solution to that. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, Uhu um, makes a material called Nopla, which is a flexible packaging uh, for beverages and sauces. It's biodegradable or it can actually be eaten. It was tested, I think, at uh, London Marathon um, a number of years ago for the runners and was very successful. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on to textiles, um, Rapa Nui has got um, a, a very good business model in the sense that not only are their t-shirts produced in real time, so they don't hold on to, to stock, um, they also have a QR code on all of their products, which um, when you click onto it, prints a label so that you can return your t-shirt at, at its end of life to be recycled into new t-shirts. Next slide. A um, couple of examples of um, rentals, um, so product this um, one, a little loop um, is a children, children's clothes rental um, solution. And then mud jeans, um, you can either buy the jeans and return them for recycling, or you can actually rent your jeans. Next slide. Um, the tech sector, um, many of you may be aware of the Fairphone. It's been around quite a while now. It's on, um, I think, version three, possibly now four. Um, where it's very, very much designed, and like a lot of tech, to be taken apart by the user. Um, if your camera breaks or if your camera um, wants upgrading, for example, you can take the camera unit um, piece out of the phone and you can buy another one from Fairphone and put that camera um, piece uh, back in. It's very much plug and play. But also what's great about Fairphone is the very ethical um, socially responsible um, with fair trade gold and conflict free materials. Next slide, please. An example of a circular laptop. This is an American company. You can choose either to have your laptop pre-assembled or actually come in bits where you put it together yourself, something that I definitely wouldn't be able to do. Um, but equally with this laptop, um, should any of those elements um, break or need upgrading, um, because it's component type, <coughs> you're able to do that. Um, next, please. A couple of examples um, which very much hit on the, the social aspect as well, um, repair cafes and libraries of things. Um, repair cafes um, very much ingrain that uh, keeping things um, in use for as long as possible um, concept. So anybody can take a, a toy, a television, a food mixer along to a repair cafe um, and Get it looked at and hopefully get it repaired by the team there it's it's voluntary just for a donation but also what's really great about it is it's using an unused skills maybe people that retired or unemployed very much community driven um, and brings a number of social benefits in addition to the um, resource efficiency side of it as well next slide please libraries of things um, again can be used very much from an environmental focus from a carbon emissions um, reduction focus where people are using drills or lawn mowers um, rather than owning them, they would uh, borrow them or rent them from a library of things. But equally in socially deprived areas, there are, <clears throat> excuse me, libraries of things um, where people can borrow items for free. That might be a badminton set, it might be a slow cooker, 
um, again, really important part of community and um, delivering social value, but again, using resources to their max, max, maximum use. Uh, next slide, please. Just really quickly in my last 30 seconds, I canter through a few different um, policies. So this is just an indication of different circular economy related policies across Europe. Um, it may be of interest for you to have a look at some circular economy route maps um, after this morning. Um, London's got a circular economy route map, as has Yorkshire, Brighton and Hove, the West Midlands Combined Authority, where they're all looking at how to bring more circularity into their regions. Next slide, please. The EU, as you expect, are driving circular economy quite heavily. Um, with their initial circular economy package in 2016, um, but also more recently in March 2022, um, a package of measures to speed up transition towards circular economy announced in their circular economy action plan. Um, and then coming into the UK, next slide, please. The resources and waste strategy um, from 2018, but more recently the waste prevention program into 2021, um, very much focused around um, waste resource use and resource security. Um, and next slide, please. The Environment Law, um, the, sorry, the Environment Act became law in 2021 with the Environmental Improvement Plan coming out earlier on this year as a refresh of the 25 year Environment Plan. Next slide, please. With actions out of that, including the extended producer responsibility for packaging, the deposit return scheme, which is in infancy in Scotland at the moment and is hopefully going to come out um, in England um, possibly next year or the year. Plastic packaging tax is obviously already in force um, and also waste food waste recycling um, from a um, household collection point perspective. Um, so that's a very quick canter through um, what the circular economy is, some different examples and policies that are driving it both from Europe and they and that's the my presentation. Great, thank you, Debbie. Thank you for it. Oh, you can applaud if you like. I'm sure she can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, great. Right. Have we got any questions for Debbie? We have already one. So if you can hang on for the microphone, I'm going to keep reiterating that so that we can make sure it gets onto the onto the recording. Uh, thank you. Going back to your um, little image of the circular from waste down to sorry from uh, take down to. <laughs> I think we'll just hang on for a moment, let that one go. <laughs> right, that's what we get for being near the airport. Um, looking at the, uh, your image that goes from take down to waste, um, it feels like a lot of what you're talking about is focusing on the waste end, reducing that and reusing. Um, um, you might quibble a bit with this statement, but I feel like um, what's destroying the earth is more the take end than the waste end. Um, and my worry is that um, you make everything circular, you're reusing everything, but we might end up doing that in addition to taking um, um, without, that, without that stopping, which might just uh, aggravate the problem rather than, rather than reducing it. How, how do you deal with the, with the take end? I feel like maybe... Um, you know, reusing things isn't sufficient to ensure that we stop taking. Yeah, no, that's absolutely a fair comment. And I think um, within the presentation, I mean, well, the first <clears throat> the first slide um, basically talked about our overconsumption. Um, and I don't think you possibly want to get into the, the degrowth um, discussion this morning because it's um, and for a lot of businesses um, very alien. Um, but I think um, something that I didn't mention this morning, um, but um, a, a book you may want to have a look at if you're not aware of it already is Donut Economics by Kate Rayworth. Um, and she very much talks about the um, economy thriving and not growing because we can't keep growing forever. Um, she uses the analogy of a, an aeroplane taking off um, and our economy is is still deemed to be in flight and going up at some point that airplanes got to land um and you're absolutely right that we, we we can't just focus on the waste at all and that is a very narrow view of circular economy and often when people talk about circular economy is just about waste management um and a bit of recycling which which is much much more than that 
and, and you do need to absolutely look at the whole process and I know what I do within the, the, the rebuild site with the surplus construction materials. Uh, when we first set that up and went for funding, there was a bit of criticism around us looking just at end of pipe. You know, were you not just perpetuating business as usual and making con contractors feel good about their surplus materials and feel good about their waste because it's going going somewhere rather than in Anfield or in, being incinerated? Um, what about the rest of the supply chain? What about the rest of the process? Um, but we do actually get involved in educating. Um, in fact, I'm doing some training with um, Carlisle College next week to absolutely do that, to speak to the students, speak to people that are just going into industry, as well as those um, already practicing, that it is absolutely about thinking how to minimize the materials that we use of the materials that we then do use to maximize the lifetime that we um use those materials for because at the end of the day even in a very circular economy those materials cannot be looped forever and some materials plastics is a, a classic example they they more often than not need uh, an injection of virgin plastics into the recycled plastics to keep the um quality required so to say that circular a circular economy looking uh, at the use and the waste only is going to be our nirvana and and save the planet is is absolutely right as that gentleman pointed out you know we, we do need to look a lot also at do we actually need whatever it is that we're looking at buying building consuming um which again does go back to that that degrowth question um and is a uh, quite a difficult conversation to have with some people. Great, thank you, Debbie. Um, next question, anybody? Somebody's got to have a question. Okay, I'm going to ask one that I did prepare earlier, and I might ask everybody if you're all too quiet. Um, so, um, Debbie, the circular economy is a big idea, and the con I mean, I've certainly found the concept quite tricky to grasp. I started um, <coughs> looking at circular economy about eight years ago uh, when I went to an Ellen MacArthur meeting at the university. Um, and I was working in sustainable materials and manufacturing at the time. Um, it's taken, yeah, I still don't think I've really quite necessarily grasped all of it, but I think it would be really interesting to understand what your top three tips are to actually maybe start you on the journey of circular economy. Um, and I wondered if you could just quickly just run through those. Um, top three tips. Um, well, as I've just said, really, it, it's about starting from the very beginning. Um, from a, a business perspective, um, looking at your material flows, what's coming into the business, what's going out of the business. Um, so how much um, of that is, is wasted at the end um, and of that waste to reduce that as much as possible, but also potentially sometimes your <clears throat> what's classed as waste is a byproduct, which somebody else can use and that's called industrial symbiosis. So again, the sandwich manufacturers, crus they might have classed as waste, but in fact, toast are classing it, classing it as a resource for them. Um, so I'd say, you know, have, have a look at that flow of materials is really important. Design, 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 design. It's so much of it is about design. Um, and as with any, any big change, it's about behavior change and culture. Um, it's about taking the whole business and your whole supply chain along for the circular ride. Okay, thank you very much. I think probably we'll leave that one there then, Debbie. Thank you so much for joining us. We really, really do appreciate it. Um, okay. And I think we'll move. Thanks for me. Yeah, well, and, and if anybody needs to get hold of Debbie, obviously the um, her email address will be, and, and the slides will be sent out later so you can get hold of everybody then. Okay. Uh, right, we are going to, is that working now? Brilliant. Well done, thank you very much. I can't see from here to see what's going on. So if anything's going on with the screens, do shout. Um, so next up, we've got Dr. Ryan Nolan from the University of Exeter, um, postdoctoral fellow there, um, a postdoctoral research impact fellow, in fact, uh, working out of the business school. Um, and Ryan works in the UKRI, that's the um, UK research. What is it? Research and innovation, that's it. Sorry, I'm so used to it being um, Innovate UK and, and the research councils, which is what they used to be separate. They've joined together. It's now UKRI. Um, and the research program that Ryan works in is the National Interdisciplinary Circular Economy 
research program, which is shortened to NICER, which is much, much easier. Um, prior to this, he's, hold, he's held teaching positions at various higher and further education institutes in the fields of business and creative industries with experience in developing curricula for large online courses um, in business and experience design. Research interests include socio-technical and political dimensions of the circular economy, as well as the infrastructures that underlie collaborative knowledge production in research environments and those that address the grand societal challenges. Um, he sits on the editorial board of the Soci Sociological Review and is affiliated with Exeter's Global Systems Institute based at the university. Um, Ryan, I'm going to hand over to you. I have got... The clicker is there. Yeah, thank you very much. Lots of buzzwords in my uh, bio there, so hopefully they'll become a little bit clearer as I go through the through my slides. Uh, so hopefully we go next. Yes, brilliant. So hello everyone. My name's Dr. Ryan Nolan, postdoctoral impact fellow at the University of Exeter. It's a real pleasure to be here to speak to you all, and I'm speaking about the uh, quite a grand topic, I think, how higher education institutions can help build capacity and capability for the circular economy. Uh, and the best way I know how to do that is by talking through some projects that I'm involved in. But first, a little bit of context for the university, which perhaps some of you, you know, are involved with anyway. But um, the university is home to five of the UK's top 100 climate scientists. And as such, a lot of the work we do embedded through all of the schools takes a real big focus uh, and interest in climate and sustainability work. The University of Exeter Business School has... Um, a small business charter award and we are you know we operate very much as a civic business school trying to engage with local businesses and the local community as much as possible last year we were voted the times higher education business school of the year award and recently we won another impact award for our work on climate change and the university has 12 leading um uh, the business school has 12 leading research centers one of them is the exeter center for the circular economy which is where i work the Centre for Circular Economy was launched in 2018 um, by Damon Ellen MacArthur of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And we're, you know, our ambition is to be a world leading centre for circular economy research um, in terms of sort of research, hardcore research, as well as teaching and policy engagement. We became the first university partner and still are the first sort of official university partner of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation last year, and we're looking forward to sort of building on that relationship as time goes by. And in fact, um, there was a, a previous event at the university, uh, an Ellen MacArthur showcase. There's another one in September, um, details of which aren't currently online, but if you keep an eye on the, the Center for Circular Economy's website, uh, that'll be in September, so information forthcoming, I, 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 wish, I should hope. The success of the center so far, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the work we do uh, in a bit more detail, um, really takes this approach, sort of triple helix approach, so engaging with policy, engaging with business, and sort of mobilizing the research community, and that's really been the key to our success over the last five years. But before I sort of go into any more detail, yeah, just a slight explanation of my slightly strange job title. Uh, as a, you know, trying to link back to the topic of how universities are helping to scale and, and build capacity and capability for the circular economy. So, Probably people are familiar with the idea of a, of a research fellow or a postdoc, even postdoctoral research fellow, as people who work at universities associated to research projects, typically to deliver um, a piece of research over a period of time. So they work on a project, finish, and you kind of deliver something and leave. Over the last few years, research impact fellows have emerged um, and are coming, you know, becoming a bit more... Uh, commonplace I suppose and although it's just the addition of one word it kind of dramatically changes the job role because half of my job is about conducting research and collaborating with the research projects but the other half is about uh, engaging with policy engaging with industry engaging with society so thinking about how we can take the research that we're doing and translate that information and the findings into you know information relevant to as many stakeholders as possible. I'm going to just reiterate some things, not repeat, but reiterate some things that uh, we heard in the last talk, but you know, education, teaching is uh, repetition, so it's always a good thing. So the circular economy, as we just heard, you know, we try to move from, uh, which on the left-hand side of this, you know, quite basic um, illustration, but quite powerful, I think. 
we move from this take make waste linear economy where things are made we use them for a bit when we perceive them not to be useful anymore we tend to throw them away into the the, the middle image there which is a as we heard a recycling economy where we make things still we take things out of the ground we use them for a bit then when we want to get rid of them they kind of some things enter into these these loops what we call reverse logistics such as recycling and then ultimately most of it ends up in the waste again the uh, rather ambitious uh, final sort of stage there is the idea of the circular economy and i say it is ambitious because they've got really nothing ending up in the bin there which you know uh, as we heard about kate rayworth's book donut economics um, might be more useful talking about a circularity economy where things stay in circulation for as long as possible at high value uh, and then you know inevitably we will have some waste so this idea of reduce reuse recycle is quite common you know we're, we're quite familiar with those terms and as we saw in the waste hierarchy in the last talk um, we're sort of trying to think a little bit more about this expanded R framework so thinking about repurpose thinking about repair as important elements of the circular economy uh, but also you know as we heard in the question there refusal so trying to use less material in the first place and really trying to rethink our relationship with things do we need the thing everything um, you know that we currently consume in our daily lives we operate under these core principles and this is kind of central to the hub and the center where i work that are the ellen macarthur principles because we you know we're in partnership with them and they operate under these sort of three simple statements eliminate waste and pollution circulate materials and products at high value that bit's underlined because it's important for as long as possible while regenerating natural capital and stocks and the important takeaways for us in those in that sense is that the circular economy is not just about managing waste at the end of a process uh, but about retaining as much value in in the economy as possible because the inherent value is you know already stored in the things that we've produced we also take regeneration seriously you know it's one principle of the circular economy and think that it's about doing it's not it's more about it's a confusing sentence that i've written more than doing less bad and really it should be a set of principles and a philosophy for for trying to do more good so just a quick rattle through those because we already had uh, had a good primer on circular economy thinking back to the topic so how universities or higher education institutions can help to um, build capacity and capability so i'll talk a little bit about the the project that i'm involved with and thank goodness for good acronyms because yes the project that i work on is called the national interdisciplinary circular economy research program or nicer which is a fantastic uh shortening of a, of a rather convoluted phrase it's a project uk-wide project um funded by ukri united kingdom research and innovation in collaboration with Innovate UK and uh, all of the research councils. And we were spread across all of the UK in, uh, I think, around 35 different universities, but we have five core research centres, what we call circular economy centres, doing work into um, strategic or material flows of strategic importance to the UK across the value chain. So, yes, some stuff on waste, but actually primarily work on inputs. So we have the um, tex uh, Textile Circularity Center based at the Royal College of Art, thinking about textiles, primarily in clothing, something that you know, we all um, have, have lots of and famously as a nation buy lots of, dispose lots of. Uh, the Center for uh, Construction-Based Minerals, which is based at University College London. They're th looking at things like sand, uh, sand and glass uh, primarily, and thinking about how, or trying to develop new techniques for producing things like concrete in more sustainable ways. You know, the production of concrete is uh, a, tricky, a tricky beast, so I say more sustainable, and that's an important qualification. We have the Center for Big Metals or Construction Metals, such as steel, uh, which is based at uh, Brunel University. Technology metals, so such as the things in our laptops and phones, um, based at the University of Exeter, Camborne School of Mines down in Cornwall. They're doing work on you know, sustainable mining because we're moving from primarily a, a sort of a carbon petrochemical based economy to potentially a, a, an economy that relies heavily on, on technology metals for, um, you know, to, to achieve net zero, our net zero goals. So important input to get right, uh, as well as chemicals. And then we have the CE hub at the top there, which has a coordination role. That's where I work. So I work 
that's based at the University of Exeter Business School. We do sort of more agnostic work, I would say, so less material specific, less sector specific, and we're looking into doing lots of work in policy, um, business model design, and uh, things like human behavior. Uh, I'm a social scientist, so my sort of primary interest is in human behavior, and fantastic that I get to engage with all these sort of material scientists on a regular basis. So the CE Hub, you know, in, in thinking of developing capacity, capability, uh, we're split up into four work packages, uh, and this is a slightly dull sort of note on governance of the project, but important no less for the topic, I think, because actually the primary work that we're doing is around building knowledge and making knowledge available. So through our website, ce-hub.org, uh, we have a knowledge platform where pretty much all of our research is made open access. Um, you know, gone are the days, or going are the days, hopefully, where university publications sit behind paywalls. Um, you know, so we're trying to take these, um, you know, often dense documents or pieces of research, distilling them down into different resources, uh, two-page summaries, videos, podcasts, and things like that. And at the bottom there, we're also trying to foster an incl inclusive and capable community. And I'm going to rush through some slides, because I've just realized I've got five minutes left. Uh, so innovation and impact. We work a lot with small businesses, SME, small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, one of the ways we've been working on this is through our, uh, what we call a collaborative research and development funding program. Um, so we've worked with lots of different SMEs throughout the country to develop circular strategies, uh, all of which you can view on our website. You can go, go on and read through some case studies. Um, we've had things from sock-eating mushrooms to break down textiles to enter... Um, sort of fibers back into the bio streams to this year concrete production using eggshells again uh, as an input for or as an alternative material for producing lime. Uh, interesting, you know, a really interesting project, but it is a feasibility study because you run into all sorts of different problems, um, such as, you know, waste regulation. As soon as something becomes a waste that can't be used or is classified as a waste that can't be used as an input. Uh, so eggshells and food waste is a particularly difficult area. We heard a little bit about roadmaps. We've done a big review of roadmaps, over 400, uh, and we're sort of in the process of producing a dashboard that will enable you to sort of, it borrows from the Chatham House research that we saw on the slide earlier, uh, enable you to sort of navigate dynamically through all these roadmaps, filtering into um, areas of interest or areas of concern for, for businesses and policymakers. We've recently also started a new project called Sector. You see the true creativity of the University of Exeter Business School there. We've taken the word sector and CE and merged them together. We're looking at broader sectors rather than specific materials in this project. Um, healthcare and defense and security we've sort of landed on. Projects in early stages, so you know, if there's anybody with uh, good ideas, I'll be very keen to talk to you afterwards, or interest in sort of collaboration, because I think one of the main things I want to try to put across is, you know, the university isn't this closed off thing we're really open to, to working with people and you know have have some capacity to do that two minutes left so I'll um, quickly talk about some education because it's not just the research we do but it's also you know education in terms of perhaps undergraduate and postgraduate education but also things that we can do um, more iteratively such as our executive education courses so we run a, a circular economy masterclass with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is a six-week iterative course. It runs three or four times a year. Um, businesses from all over the world engage in this course, and we've had regularly engagement with uh, people like Philips, Microsoft, BlackRock, um, Danone, and we get people working in those uh, companies and across all sectors um, to come in and sort of give sessions on you know, circularity within their businesses as well as having expertise from the university to deliver content on it. Uh, we've started sort of venturing into customized executive education, so we've been approached by uh, some organizations that are interested in really specific or niche areas that move beyond the principles of circularity, and we've started uh, standing up these bespoke courses. And we can do that quite quickly, again, quite iteratively, so if anybody's interested in that, I'd be super keen to talk about that as well and the extra MBA course which is really built around circular economy and you know we get a big uh, cohort every year of people that are largely attracted to Exeter because of the emphasis 
And again, in that, we work closely with, with businesses, local and national, um, to run things like uh, what we have a corporate challenge where a business will come in, we'll set a live brief with the students. Uh, this year was, was DS Smith, and they sort of set a, a reuse challenge for their, their packaging. Um, and students break down into groups, uh, you know, they're, and they're all sort of coming from at least five years professional experience as a qualification to get on the MBA. So they put together really, you know, useful and um, actionable plans that you know companies can sort of take away but plenty of other opportunities as well so yeah we're, we're open we're open for collaboration is what i'm what i'm trying to get at here uh, and yes please that's kind of uh, that's that's all my time but if you're if you're interested in any of the work please visit the knowledge hub qr code there which will also take you to our website where you can read more about you know funding opportunities and other funded projects thank you very much Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Um, if you can stay here, that'd be brilliant because we'll take some questions. Um, I just want to say, as an ex-university um, of Exeter employee, um, are there any um, impact and partnership development people in the in the in the audience here? No. Okay, I'm going to plug them because that's what I used to be. Um, so they're the people that you need to speak to, sort of from the the innovation, impact, and business um, directorate at the uni, um, and they will help you set anything up that you need to do. That's whether it's research, whether it's education, innovation, whatever. And Ryan will work closely with those people to make those that what to provide you with what you need within your business. Um, I know there are some carbon neutral concretes out there. Um, Art Marine are doing one down in, uh, they've been part of the exist group as well, so Art Marine have been doing that down in, um, they're now down in Truro, but they're, um, they're based out of Brixham. Um, and that business model design, the knowledge transfer again, that tech transfer um, is really important. And I know people who've done the Exeter MBA and have said it's absolutely brilliant. So that's my plug, done that. Um, right, okay, do we have some questions please? I think that's our, our next stop. Brilliant, thank you very much. And thank you for waiting for the microphone as well. <laughs> Perfect. Hi. Um, you mentioned the kind of end of waste or the waste regulations as a kind of barrier. Um, looking, I work in the construction industry and we do a lot around um, soil treatment and reuse actually in Hillbarton. Um, why d do you think that review of the waste regulations as a whole is like an important step that the government needs to take to enable easy reuse across all sectors of waste or yeah thanks it's yeah an interesting question i think it's it's difficult to say yes or no i think because you know there's all sorts of uh you know the question earlier was talking kind of getting to this idea of a rebound effect or um unintended consequences i suppose so saying yes more regulation or a review of regulation uh, in principle, I think is use would be useful across all waste streams, uh, give or take. You know, obviously there's things that really will never be sort of used as an input for anything else. Um, and you know, the example of unintended consequences using sort of sludge as uh, you know for for putting on fields that are filled with microplastics has obviously been a quite a huge um, disaster over recent years. Uh, but yeah, I think in principle a review of of um, the classification of when something becomes waste so that it can have some opportunity to sort of enter into some of these reverse logistics or enter into, um, you know, rather than being a waste, becoming an output for something else. The eggshell example is a good one. Thousands and thou millions of eggshells, you know, wasted across the, this country every year had a feasibility study that shows it's viable and scalable to produce lime, good quality lime actually out of, out of them. But yeah, current um, environment agency regulation sort of puts, puts an end to it directly and we're sort of in discussion with, those, with them um, around some of these questions. But in principle, yes, but unintended consequences all the time. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Anybody else? More questions? Yes, brilliant. Uh, Katie's going to decide who she's going to come to first. <laughs> Hello there. Hi, uh, I'm Craig Cabber, head up the real estate team for NatWest. Um, so I've got a particular interest in the built environment. Um, and we're doing a lot of work with our customers to see how we can reduce the carbon footprint of the, the built environment. It's responsible for about 40% of carbon emissions in this country. Mm. We've got a particularly old stock in this country compared to other countries as well. Um, we're working with EPC ratings and BRIAM ratings with commercial properties. Um, and we're doing lots of retrofit to see what we can do to improve the efficiency of buildings. 
So we're doing a lot of work around you know, the carbon output of a building once it's established, but the embedded carbon is still quite a big issue. Um, so we talked about the concrete. The concrete's a massively energy intensive process to manufacture, but still used widely across the country in terms of construction. Mm. What work, if anything, are you doing in the university around the built environment and reducing the, I guess, the carbon, the embedded carbon in terms of construction generally in the country? Because mm. it's a huge, it's a huge issue that we, we're not seeing a huge amount of progress being made at the minute. There's certain bits being done, but not a lot. Yeah, thanks. Good question. And it's, you know, it's not my, it's certainly not the area that I'm directly working in, but at our Circular Economy Centre at UCL, the, it's called the Interdisciplinary Centre, Circular Economy Centre for Construction-Based Minerals. Uh, they're primarily doing work into, yeah, as I say, inputs. So thinking about the production of materials in more carbon neutral ways. Uh, but they, they have a big work stream on built environment. So th my suggestion, uh, slightly... Um, uh, getting out of answering the question a little bit would be to to check check them out. So UCL um, mineral based construction materials and they're uh, similar to us. You know they they'll be putting their resources and videos online to sort of demonstrate the work they're doing there. Okay, thanks. I'll check them out. Yeah, apologies. <laughs> um, actually, I can fill in if you like. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, old job again. Um, so, um, Raphael Evanai, Do Dr. Raphael Evanai at the University of Exeter is absolutely looking at carbon neutral building materials, particularly concrete. Um, he's a Roman, and the Romans did this years ago, and it was fine, and it's still standing. And, you know, embodied carbon, you're talking about that, he's, he's, he's got it covered. He um, has a recipe at the moment, which is just going through validation at the minute. He's, he, we want to grant a 1.4 million pound UK um, Innovate UK grant last year I think it was um, yeah so he's got a, a project about that he can do uh, net zero carbon so carbon neutral is pretty much carbon neutral and as I mentioned Arc Marine earlier they're also working on this and I think they've gone carbon negative on on their recipe as well there are definitely people around who, who do that and the grant that Lele went for was through the um, the, the, the building materials right. up at UCL the circular economy hub there if you want to have a chat about that later or and epcs as well i can also talk about that if you need me to <laughs> lots of things catch up with me afterwards yeah that's cool sorry i'm doing old job new job this job whatever everything today um okay are there any more questions you, there was one more over there there we go hello thank you i'm andy johnson i work with um farmers and food and <clears throat> given that food is a third of accounts for a third of all greenhouse gas emissions food production transport um, why is food not one of the five primary centres and really shouldn't, shouldn't that be done and I would love to help you set one up in Exeter. Yeah, absolutely. That's, um, you know, the, I guess the reason why it's not part of this project in particular is because this was, you know, uh, a sort of government driven material science research project and we have another project um, at the university that is focused on sort of agriculture and, and food called uh, uh, Arca, that one's called. But actually, no, that's not quite right. I can, I'll look that up for you and I can pass the details on to you that afterwards. Um, but that's colleagues of mine. I'm not involved in that one. Um, but yes, absolutely. So this sector project that I sort of mentioned briefly uh, is, a, is an additional sort of fund that we've, we've um, secured and we're trying to explore some different areas that NISA currently doesn't cover. Uh, so, you know, we've got some... Um, capacity, I, I should say, and some sort of interest in um, co-producing or coming to an understanding in collaboration with areas that should be now focused on. So I say defense uh, and healthcare is, are the two that we've sort of found. I think um, uh, sort of ret retail we're, we're also thinking about as well, but yeah, it'd be great to, to have a discussion, especially if you're keen to, to help, help out on that as well. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. I I think we will move on to our next speaker, if that's okay. Thank you very much, Ryan. Cheers. That was brilliant. Really good understanding of what's happening in the <laughs> research development innovation. Right, so our next speaker is Mark Dodwell, who is a director from NatWest, NatWest Climate Propositions team. Um, NatWest are one of our newest sponsors um, at Exist. Uh, Mark's worked there for 15 years, led various teams acro across NatWest, and for the last three years, 
Mark has been working on, sorry, I have to read my notes for this, um, working on climate decarbonisation sector and he's been helping businesses to understand what and how to decarbonise using innovative propositions and partnerships created by NatWest. And so this is where we kind of start getting into the things that you actually can do right now to begin this process for yourselves. Okay, Mark, here you go. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first thing I've got to try and do is, uh, is navigate the technology and get live on our carbon planner system. So bear with me. Somebody tell me if that's come up on the screen. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. This is where I need Ali. <laughs> on okay let's see if this let's see if this works uh, and just turn away while I put my password in if you wouldn't mind <laughs> I did this a few weeks ago in uh, at Swansea University and I was halfway through typing in the uh, password when the audience shouted at me and said you need to probably stop so uh, we'll not make the same mistake again um, so bear with me <laughs> that's really weird all right let's try that this is where I'm relying on the technology to work. <laughs> Wi-Fi's gone. Typical. Just go back to the slides if you need to. Come on, internet. Just go to slides. You sure? Yeah, go to slides. Yeah. Always have a backup plan. <laughs> So yeah, good morning everybody. Uh, Mark Dobwell, part of the Climate Propositions team. Um, and let's just clear up right from the start, what's NatWest doing here? It's a question I get asked a lot. Uh, uh, was it Innovate Zero a couple of weeks ago in London? Uh, we had a massive stand there. We had lots of people coming on the stand saying, what's NatWest doing playing in this space? So um, uh, three years ago, Alison Rose, our CEO, uh, created our purpose-led strategy. And climate is actually at the forefront of that strategy. Uh, and I guess, what we've been doing, what does that mean uh, for the bank? It's, there's kind of two prongs to that. One is that we get our own shop in order, uh, and, and as a bank, we, we make sure that we're on a net zero path. But the other half of it is that we help our customer base transition to net zero. Uh, and I myself work personally in the commercial space, so supporting businesses across the UK, and as Sarah said, for the last three years, kind of looking at how do we help businesses decarbonize. Uh, Craig just touched on just a moment ago with that question, some of the things that we're doing. One of the things we have done is create the Carbon Planner tool, um, uh, and this was a, uh, this was, now that's not working, Ali. <laughs> don't worry, don't worry. Let me do it this way. Frozen. <laughs> 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 
I hope so. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, last year we created Calm Planner, and one of the reasons we did that, a lot of our research, a lot of our insight with our customer base, uh, we bank somewhere between 25 and, and 30 percent of of the UK corporate, uh, well, business customers bank with NatWest. And the research we'd done suggested that those customers are in three buckets when it comes to net zero. They're either in the got a strategy, know what they're doing, know where they're going. So things like circular economy, they'll be all over. Uh, you have at the other end, climate deniers. And I have been, I've experienced it on events like this where people have actually sat there and said, what are you talking about? There's no need. And then we have thousands of businesses that sit in the middle that are kind of going, where do I start? What do I do? So it's probably, uh, you know, there's a real mixture of, of audience here today and a lot of what Debbie had talked about and what Ryan's talked about. Some of you may be thinking, that's great, but how do we get going? How do we get started? And that's why we created um, Carbon Planner. And Carbon Planner is uh, uh, it's a, 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 a carbon footprinting tool. It's free to use in the UK. It's available for any UK business, so you don't have to bank with NatWest to use it. Uh, that's a real key point and a, a real key thing that we wanted to do is, is kind of make this available. What I would have done with the, the technology was to kind of walk you through the platform, but with the help of slides, I'm gonna kind of hopefully still do that some justice. Uh, I just won't be able to show you. There's a whole, whole range of support in there of, of, of help to use the tool when you first log in and it's a, it's very quick we can share the link um, the link will come out as part of the pack uh, if you sign up five minutes email address you'll get a password within five minutes uh, and it can get you into the system when you first go in it asks you if you want to take a tour and it will walk you through what it does and how it does it and 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 how you use it um, but there's lots of support functions in there We've built this tool with, we didn't just do it on our own, uh, who are NatWest to kind of tell you what a footprint is and, and what's the science behind it. So we've worked with a company called EcoAct, uh, have, have helped us build this tool. Uh, we've worked with a company called Spherix, who are now part of uh, the Sage Group, uh, worked with them. So those guys have checked our homework. So when we, we kind of produce a carbon footprint, uh, for a section, uh, for a category, uh, we you know we, we we can take comfort that, that that's a, a fairly accurate uh, tool. So the tool is driven um, by data. Now we launched in Q4 of last year as a minimum viable product, uh, and there is a lot of that manual data collation at the moment. What we want, where we want to get to, is we know the data is out there and it's in all sorts of areas. How do we drag that data in to stop business having to go and find it? Um, but the data is out there. Um, at the moment, you have to go and find it. So we've got nine categories, uh, business travel, uh, business vehicles, employee commuting, freight, fuels and electricity, materials, uh, purchases I'll come back to in a moment, refrigerant gas, waste and water. So some of the top, top, topics we've been talking about this morning, we capture in here. We've got two parts to the data section. There are essential questions that you have to answer as a title suggests. If you answer those questions, it will give you a footprint. We've tried to make it intuitive. We've tried to make it easy to use. Um, and if I was in the system now, you, you'd see how easy it is. But they're fairly simple questions, uh, but you do have to go and get that data to answer them. You then have the option to add, answer additional questions for each category. If you answer those additional questions, you don't have to, but if you do, it will potentially refine the footprint for you and it will potentially give you more actions. Because one, one of the things we wanted to do with this is not just give a business a footprint, it's like, what do you then do with that footprint? So once you've collated all that data, uh, it will give you a footprint. Before I move on to footprint, the reason we've got purchases circled there, that automation of data, the first bit that we've done, and we launched it about eight weeks ago with Sage, uh, working with Sage, if a business uses Sage or QuickBooks today, we can now, uh, Carbon Planner can now talk to your accounting package. So it will pull in your purchasing data, just purchasing data at the moment. So a couple of clicks, it will, it will talk, the two systems will talk, it will pull your purchasing data through and it will give you a scope three for your purchasing data. That's the first of, of each of these categories that we want to automate. Um, so once you've got that data, uh, hoping this will work. Uh, yeah, there's, so there's the purchasing uh, piece, as you can see. QuickBooks, Sage are on there at the moment. Uh, we are currently working uh, with Xero uh, and others as well to get those added to this platform so that it starts to talk to additional uh, accounting software packages. Once those, uh, those data 
sections, all those categories are complete, uh, then you get your footprint. And it starts to break down your footprint into scope one, into scope two, into scope three. It starts to really kind of show you which elements are really contributing to your footprint. The next thing you can do as a business is, is set a target. And there's two ways of doing that. You can either sit down as a, as a leadership team and decide how you want to target, where do you want to reduce, by what time, how much do you want to reduce by. Actually, if that's too complex and we know that businesses, feedback from business with you know, busy people, they've got businesses to run, actually you can literally just hit a button on there and it will, it will automatically set a target for you if you're not sure where to start. So once you've done that, you've got your footprint, you've got your target, it will uh, then start to give you actions. And this is where the tool really comes to life. So for each of those categories, it starts to show you what actions you could take. So uh, the one on here is fuels and electricity. You can see the types of actions it's starting to suggest. The little box you can see on the right is where we've clicked into one of those actions. If you click into any one of those tiles, it will start to break down that action for you. And what it will do in that breakdown is start to show you what the CO2 saving would be, what the cost saving would be, what the investment required, the initial investment is for, for implementing that action, uh, and then what the payback period would be. Linked to that, if you go into an action, we've also got a huge thought leadership library that sits behind the tool. So if you want to do some more reading, because you might think, well, it says, you know, install solar panels. Well, how do I do that? Where do I go and do that kind of thing? We've got leading, uh, thought leadership material that can help with that um, and, and we also have products and services obviously that, that the, you know, the, the local banking teams can help you with that implementation uh, you know the uh, I'll move on to that actually yeah this is on this slide so products and services this is where we we start to highlight how we can support you with the implementation of these actions so um, there's that resource library, helps you with that understanding, but then with the, um, the, the, the products and services, obviously there's things like asset, green asset finance, bank loans, uh, green loans. We've got a couple of others on there just explain. NatWest Swoop uh, shows on the products and services. That's a grant finding tool. It's a very simple, pop your postcode in, it will tell you what grants are available in and around your area. You can't see it on the screen, it's just slightly off screen on this slide, but there's partner services. So under partner services, we now work with Octopus Energy uh, and Octopus help our customers with e charge points for electric vehicles. Link to that, it's not on there at the moment, but it's coming in the next few weeks. We have a number of other propositions that we've launched that, that have been through pilot uh, and are, are about to go into market. So when you get to some of the actions in here, energy, we all know, um, and it's probably not really a, a climate focus, it's, it's more of a current cost challenge. We all know what energy prices have been doing. Uh, we have a couple of propositions there. We have a proposition with a company called Purse. Uh, if you put your postcode in, it will find your business. It will tell you and give you um, very quickly energy savings uh, ideas that you can make. We have a proposition with a company called Absolar, which again, put your details in of your property. It will look at your property. It will use LiDAR data and it will tell you how much solar you could put on your property. Uh, how you go about doing that, local installers that could do it for you. Again, it kind of pay, plays into how much that would cost, what the payback periods are, et cetera. Those two propositions, those energy propositions will start to appear on here under our products and services. And then finally, we're working with a company called Diode Energy, which is helping with that EV transition. So uh, we know businesses know they need to make that transition to EV. Their staff need to make that transition. We have a tool that can help you understand how and when to, you could make that switch and the, and the services that need to go with that. So uh, I sent this slide to, to Ali a couple of weeks ago just to kind of sum up. That number's now, there's over 4,000 businesses using the tool in the UK. Uh, so we've risen a few hundred over the last few weeks. Um, we've got uh, over 2,000 customers are helping us with qualitative and quantitative research. Uh, we've just done, a, 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 I was actually part of a session yesterday the big kind of message we were getting back from some of the quality of research yesterday was the tool is really good. I'd love to have been able to show you how easy it is to use because that was the feedback I've been given. Um, but actually, we don't make enough of it. We haven't shouted about it enough. Um, that, that fact that you don't need to bank with us, there's an 80-20 split at the moment. So 20% of businesses that are using it don't bank with us and, and, and have no relationship with us at all. Um, the, uh, yeah, there's 44 unique actions in the tool at the moment. 
Uh, the only sector it doesn't work with, and I'm sorry to the gentleman over there, is the ag sector. It doesn't fit with the ag sector at the moment. We do have other tools that support the ag sector, um, but, but, and we are working on how we get carbon planners to fit that, but it should be uh, suitable for any other sector. Uh, and I guess the point um, of the tool, as I said right at the start, it's giving businesses uh, you know, across the UK an understanding of where do I start? What do I do? I guess just going, you know, the whole point around circular economy, as you saw in there, again, I can't show you it, but there are, there are waste sections in there. There are um, kind of water sections in there. And those sections will give you unique actions, again, that you can take that play to the circular economy that Debbie's talked about and that, that, that Ryan's talked about. So I got the five minute sign two, two minutes ago, uh, and that's pretty much me. So. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Well done. Um, and well done for dealing with our tech. <laughs> um, OK, questions from the audience, please. What do we have? Who do we have? Fantastic. Thank you. Microphone is on its way to you. Thanks, Katie. Hi. Um, yeah, uh, James Nunn from Hawley, work uh, MEP consultants in the construction industry. Um, great tool, um, love the look of it, and it seems to me it's a little bit like um, a carbon version of EPC or DEC, um, Design Energy Certificates, that kind of thing in terms of giving an understanding of where you are at the moment. Do you think there's any value in it um, becoming like that tool, so everyone has an EPC or a DEC carbon version, so that you can understand where you are at the moment, but also as we know, EPCs now have manifested themselves into if you've got less than an E, you can't market your building in the future. Um, do you think there's any value in something yeah, like that I, being I, more widespread? I know this is your tool. Yeah, <laughs> I, I guess you know there are other tools out there, um, uh, I, but the regulation behind it is not it's not kind of written really at the moment. What we've tried to do is work with companies that, that you know know what they're doing, so that it's really that challenge. Like I said, the, the customer insight was saying. Um, you know, we get, we're getting businesses who might be in a supply chain and actually the, the business at the top of the supply chain is now saying, I need to know your carbon footprint. Um, so it's that I think what, what you're asking, you know, will potentially come. One of the things we, some of the feedback we've had from businesses is, Great, I've got my footprint, but what does that mean? Uh, and, and how do I compare to my peers? So we've got some benchmarking functionality coming in in the next, in the next couple of months, actually. We've got a two-year roadmap for this tool. It gets updated every six weeks with new functionality. So the start, I think, is that benchmarking piece, but, but really it needs to come from, I guess, from government. What's the, 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 the true regulation for... Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. Actually, like yeah. <laughs> thank you. Next question. Oh, brilliant. There's one at the back, Katie. Hi. Um, how have you used the, or how are you going to use the data that you capture to lobby government and suggest? approaches that they may, may want to take, for example, progressive tax, taxation, or uh, uh, as the previous um, questioner said, maybe thinking about ways that they can um, limit people to sell assets which aren't um, carbon neutral. Yeah, I, I'm probably not high, up, high enough up the NatWest food chain to understand how we're doing that. Uh, Alison Rose works for at C, our CEO, Dame Alison Rose now, um, you know, does work very closely with government. We'll, we'll lobby on, on all, so, all sorts of things. And, and you know, she, she, you, you can only go on Google and you'll see her at dinners with Prince Charles. Uh, and and kind of, I think we, you know, we, the point is we've taken the lead here. I, I, I probably can't answer your question because I don't know kind of how, how she's adopting those conversations. But we do lobby government. We work, um, you know, to try and enforce change. There's a lot going on in the transport sector that we are trying to, to kind of push as well. Uh, with transport being one of the biggest greenhouse gas emitters but but uh, i guess the data we capture you know we don't use that and, and share that anywhere else so you know businesses have said to us what are you doing with my data we'll consolidate that to to, to kind of help inform government but, but you know we would never go with individual kind of data um subjects. Yeah, i'm not thinking about um, at yeah. uh, individual company level and no. talking about consolidated I mean, yeah. that's where the interesting patterns will come isn't yeah it? absolutely yeah, yeah. I, it, I, I guess you know, at, we've just 
started to get the strategic database that sits behind this. We've not been able to pull the data out, to, to, to your point, to, to do that. We've now got a tool that can do that. So we'll start to use that, analyze what that is telling us, uh, and I'm sure that will kind of play into uh, some of the conversations that our seniors have uh, you know, with, with central government. Okay, um, one of my companies is a, is a uh, NatWest uh, client. So I'll yeah. go in and try and use the, the tool. Great, thank you. How, how long will it take me to do? And, uh, what, and what, how useful will it be for me? Uh, I've got some stats on here, <laughs> on the screen here. Um, you know, 77% 77 believe Carbon Planner will be extremely or very valuable to their organization. Um, you know, the, 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 there are elements of it that aren't perfect. The answer to answer your question, it depends how, how much data you need to collect. Some of those categories may or may not be relevant to your business. Um, we've had businesses that have done it in a couple of hours. We've had businesses that it's taken a few days because they've they kind of got to go and get this information, get that information. There is a functionality within the tool that you don't have to do it all yourself. So if, if you sign up, you can invite other members of your business to, to kind of help with that collation. Um, but yeah, it's really, it, it depends how deep you go into it. If you answer the essential and the additional questions, obviously there's more, more data required for those. Um, so it, it can be varied. What I would say, the, the, um, the feedback we've had from businesses that have gone through that, that kind of gave us that feedback, well, it's quite manually intensive and it takes a lot of time. What they've said to us is the outputs and the actions that it gives them actually far outweighs the pain of, of producing the data. Uh, and you know, it really is kind of at the forefront of our strategy is automating that data. We know the data is out there for those categories. We just got to find the right partners to work with that have got it and, and we can then just get the two systems talking to each other. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Pleasure. I think I will send you away back to your seat. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> thanks everybody. I would just very briefly say you two need to talk to each other. <laughs> okay, fine, good, done that by then. Um, so next up, we've got Philippa Roberts, who is co-founder and CEO of uh, the Binnick Group. Um, Philippa has been working in the waste resources and circular economy sector for more than 20 years. Um, she's been a non-exec of a 14 million plus private waste company and served three three-year terms as a member. I can't say this because I'm not Welsh. Der Cymru, there you go, thank you very much, thank you very much, which is um, parent company of Welsh Water. I, I do languages, but Welsh is not one of them. Um, she's a chartered waste manager, a fellow of the RSA, and speaks around the world about circular economy and resource management. And the summary of your, talk, of your talk today is what a circular economy means to us, different business examples from companies around the globe, and how Binit is progressing on our circular economy journey. Thank, thank you. you very much, Philippa. I shall hand that over to you. And look, guess what? I haven't moved the slides on again. Is this how we... Yes, that's your clicker, and you can move through. Look how much shorter I am than everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I just had two coffees, and, and it's not my natural proclivity to stand still, so this is going to be quite challenging, actually. Um, in my defence, can I say, Welsh Water is the only non-profit distributing water company in England and Wales, has a completely different model. They don't spend their money on dividends. It goes back into fixing that crumbling infrastructure and making nice reservoirs and things for the people who can enjoy them. They go out to their customers and ask. It's a fantastic model and one that we're trying to encourage the next government, because there might be a different one, to adopt should Thames and other companies go under. Um, hi everyone, sorry I've been in um, I had some meetings and then stepping in for James from Bike Club. So I will mention Bike Club. I am a Bike Club customer. You'll find out what Bike Club is. But this is to talk about what circular economy means to us, to me and to the business that I run. So it started with sea turtles, actually. Um, so I didn't get into university first time round. I had an enforced gap year. <laughs> Can I hold one? <laughs> Can I use the holdy one? Can we? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Would that work? Yeah. Would that work yeah, right 
sorry, sitting on Zoom calls and then two meetings, and I was like, two coffees, two meetings. So um, in force gap year, right? So I went out to cross, so I had an argument with my dad because he said, you can't waste a year, you didn't get into university. Oh my God, this is terrible. So I volunteered on a sea turtle conservation project in Costa Rica, because I'm a middle class woman, I'm a, uh, I was able to do things like that. Um, and before that, I wanted to go and work in the city. I wanted to be a banker, and that fundamentally changed what I've done with my life. So. The sea turtles were dying because of poaching, but because of the plastic waste that's floating around in the oceans. You'd probably know this. So there's me as a young 18-year-old. I know, haven't I aged well, out in Costa Rica. And I have then spent the last 20-plus years trying to get those plastics back out of the ocean. And one of the things I found in trying to talk to people about behavior change and thinking about the stuff they throw away is that back in the end of the 90s and the early 2000s, it was always very hair-shirted. It was very reductionist. It was about doing less, doing things that are probably less fun. Don't fly, buy less, consume less by things that might not taste so good. And the exciting thing about a circular economy is actually it's about a positive message. It's about redesigning the way our economy works and how we think about things that doesn't have to be reductionist. It's not saying you have to have a lesser quality of life to save the planet. It's saying we are really smart people and if we think about the products and the services that we use, we can have an equally fantastic quality of life with wonderful products and holidays abroad because that's going to happen. The airlines are going to have to figure out a way to make flying carbon neutral. Someone will invent a better fuel because we're not going to you know, shut the door. That horse is has disappeared into the distance. So a circular economy for me is really exciting because it gives us this op opportunity to reduce our impacts. So I'm sure you've been told all what a circular economy is about. I like to surprise myself by not knowing what slides are coming up next. Um, so, oh, surprise, it's the butterfly diagram. So, Binit provides brilliant waste and recycling services for businesses. I have the fantasy that one day my customers will only have two bins. There will be a bin for technological recycling. So, for your plastics, your metals, your glass, stuff that can be technically recycled back into another product. And then a compostable bin, because everything else will be made from plant-based products. Every biro will be bioplastics, and you'll put it in the compostable bin, and we will use it to regenerate and restore the planet. And there won't be any rubbish left over. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Come on, everyone, redesign your products so it fits in one of just two bins. And how much cheaper will that be? So Binit started off as a litter app, and the idea was to stop that plastic getting into the ocean because when you wander around, you see overflowing bins, and it's the kind of broken window scenario. When bins start overflowing, people then consciously litter near them. Nobody likes to walk down the street and chuck something over their shoulder, but they do carefully place them on top of other containers, which is kind of not like littering, but obviously it's littering. And one of the interesting things you find is often the stuff that is placed is stuff that people want to recycle but don't know how to. So it's coffee cups and it's glass bottles because there is nowhere in the public space for them to put this stuff. So they hope that the kind of magic recycling elves go out at night and run around picking up the stuff they've consciously littered in order to recycle it. Fascinating problem. The other bit, this is my favorite pictures of Covent Garden. Wouldn't you be pleased if you were one of these shops with really expensive retail space and every night that's what it looks like outside your shop, which is still open? Because it turns out that a lot of litter comes from poor trade waste services. So companies put bags out on streets. In Exeter, those bags are ripped open by seagull students and homeless people. The litter blows around. Litter and fly tipping is a billion pound a year problem for us as taxpayers. And it then attracts other litter, which is where Binit came about. So we work with our customers to try and increase recycling, reduce that litter and the impact of that litter and make them think about what they're throwing away. And we do it on a model where the traditional model is, you know, if you're on your high street, you have every shop might have space for a bin or two out the back. If you've not got much space, it might just be a rubbish bin, might just be a rubbish and recycling bin. 
In densely populated areas, our customers share the bins. So suddenly, instead of having eight bins and they're all one rubbish, one recycling, you'll have food, you'll have glass, you'll have cardboard, source segregation, better recycling, less contamination, higher quality, and then the most appropriate vehicle to come and pick it up. So sometimes it's me in my car if I'm coming to have a meeting. I'm not going to drive away if there's something I can take back with me. Let's save a vehicle movement. Fun fact, bin lorries do 26, they weigh 26 tonnes and they do four miles to the gallon. Four miles to the gallon. Who wants a 26 tonne diesel vehicle driving around your city centre to pick up stuff that actually you shouldn't be throwing away in the first place? So um, this is the back of central train station in Exeter, for those of you who know it. So before, there were nine vehicle movements a week. Most people didn't recycle. It looked like a tip. We pimped their bin store, that's what we call it. Um, and now they have, you can't really see it, it's food bin, glass bin, recycling, the separate cardboard, separate rubbish, seven vehicle movements, two tons of carbon saved a year on one shared bin store. So our bins look nicer because you, know, you need to make bins look nicer. And we use technology to do it. We use technology to manage it. So all the bins have QR codes, takes you to a web-based app, we're collecting data. And we have this wonderful uh, network effect with the data. The more we get, the more we understand different business types, sizes, locations, the waste they produce, what good looks like, and how we can then change behaviors, which is what we do. Because interestingly, technology is one of the key enablers of a circular economy. But the important bit is that it's an enabler. It's not about using technology for the sake of using technology. There is so much stuff out there and there's so much data out there. And if we start using it properly, we can start making really smart changes really quite simply to the point where almost a third of required CO2 reductions can come from stuff that's already there. So we don't need to keep reinventing the wheel. So uh, sorry if I'm repeating stuff that people said earlier, but the OECD have talked about the five different business models that can be used to help move us towards a circular economy. Now, obviously, these are the three that my business focuses on most of all. Predominantly, we're sort of resource recovery, but a circular economy is about so much more than recycling. It is not just recycling, it is that redesign element. So obviously we help companies reduce the contamination, increase their recycling rates, and make sure that that stuff is going to places that we can audit, that it actually is being recycled, it is going back into supply chains. And we're increasingly working on different products to try and close the loop. So key kegs is a good example. The plastic kegs that craft brewers and things use. So we work with key kegs and poly kegs. And we take those and they are separated, the clear and the black plastic. And it goes back over to the Netherlands to go back into key kegs. So it's a completely closed loop system. We're doing the same sort of thing, working with some garden centers and Evergreen, who are the company who make like miracle Grow, so the big heavy compost bags, so for the bags that hold compost and grit and bird seed, again, technically recyclable, but the systems aren't in place. So we're working with some garden centers in the southwest for take-back schemes to capture those materials and get them back into the chain. So replacing the virgin materials with the same material that's been recycled. Another part, another one of the circular economy business models is around product life extension. And again, waste data can be really interesting in this respect because we can see what people are throwing away. And for any business, when you're throwing something away, it's showing there's an inefficiency somewhere in your system. So if we can get data about what you're buying, we can start to look at how that flows through your business and help companies identify where there's wastage in the system. So we're working at the moment with a company that provides the software for new product development around food products and then the ingredients that go into a product in a factory. And so they know such detail about every single component of the ingredient that goes in and we know what the waste is at the back end. And we're seeing if we can start matching those data sets to help them make smarter decisions about the ingredients they're putting into the products to the point where actually there might be tweaks they can make to the ingredients that means the food waste has value instead of a cost to them at the back end. So there's all these interesting things we can be doing that help pocket, did I put it? businesses on their circular journey with the waste data. The sharing model 
is one of the five different business models. Um, so here in Exeter, we have a library of things. Anyone heard of a library of things? Yeah. So you all know what that is. Such a straightforward thing. I moved house recently, so I use the vacuum cleaner, and it's brilliant, the carpet washing vacuum cleaner thing. The average drill is used for something like 17 minutes a year. We have all these bits of kit that we buy that are full of valuable resources that we use for a tiny fraction of time. And increasingly, library of things where you can sign up, pay an annual membership, and actually borrow this stuff instead of buying it will become an in increasingly, I think, popular model. And a lot of the big brands are starting to move behind this. So this is... Um, on IKEA's website, and it's talking about a project that's up and running in the Netherlands already, where instead of buying IKEA furniture, you, you rent a room, essentially, and they will kit out the room for you. So, I want dining room. <laughs> and you pick the stuff off their website, and then you pay a rental fee. So, this idea that, that actually you don't physically have to own the stuff is something that I think will happen increasingly and then the onus is on the manufacturer of the product to make it last as long as possible. They only build in obsolescence if they want us to keep buying the same thing. If they want us to rent it, they make more money if it lasts longer. So it fundamentally changes the way they think about their product. For me, I've always owned stuff. I grew up in a generation where my music was on vinyl and cassette and CDs. Like, why wouldn't you own it? But pretty much everybody in my team has their music through Spotify, actually. And I think one of the interesting things is how, as the generations change, the younger generations do lease and not own so much more of their stuff. You know, I, my first car was one that I bought for a few hundred pounds. Who now owns? How few p young people actually own their cars? They pay a monthly thing and switch them every four years. So the mentality is kind of changing anyway in a way that fits with circular economy models. Linked to this is a similar thing, but slightly different product as a service, which is what Bike Club does. So I have a nine-year-old. I now pay month Bike Club a monthly fee, and he has a brand new bike. And when he grows out of it, I send it back, and they send another one that's bigger. And if he decides that orange is no longer his favorite color and it's going to be black, we'll swap it again and get a different color one. And they refurb these bikes and they keep them going. So again, instead of buying the product, you're buying the service. Miele is another brand that's already doing this. So they sell washing machines that last an incredibly long time already. But again, in Europe, you can rather than buy the washing machine, you buy the washes. So you say, I'm a family of four, I need three washes a week. They charge you per wash per week. They supply you a washing machine, they supply you detergent, and they supply you feedback on how you're using the washing machine. Oh, that one was too hot. You've used too much detergent in this one. To help the washing machine last even longer. So instead of spending, I don't know, 800 quid on a washing machine, you're just paying per wash, and they are helping you make that machine last longer. So the product becomes the service. And actually, in a circular economy, we've been doing this sort of stuff for years. And lots of not-for-profits have been doing this sort of stuff for years. This is just a, a little shop in Exeter. They take hardback books of the stock from libraries that's no longer used and no longer lent out, and from secondary schools. And they work with people giving them training and new skills and turn them into notebooks. So really, really simple, effective scheme. You'll have seen charity shops everywhere. It's keeping products circulating, often at a higher value for as long as possible. So St. Petrox in Exeter and um, Trade is a brand that has a load of shops down in London. They upcycle these items as well. They make them more valuable, more desirable, and keep them circulating. So for me, a circular economy is a positive thing. It's a, a journey rather than a destination. It's something we are actively trying to do all the time, looking at the, the services that we provide, the bins that we provide, how we make them last longer, how we make sure they're recyclable. But it can impact and be found in so many different areas. And for me, I think part of the thing about the circular economy is the sharing of the knowledge. It's the other bit that needs to be circulating as well. So events like this are really important for us all to be able to talk about the things that we can do, the things that we are doing, 
the things that have gone wrong, but the things that have worked well as well. Because I think there are so many opportunities to make lots of little changes that all together can have a great impact. Thank you. No, it's fine, you could. Thank you, Philip, for that. It's absolutely brilliant. It's really, really interesting. It's fantastic to hear the stuff that you're doing and have been doing over the past few years. That's really, really cool. Um, so, questions is my next thing I knew there would be. <laughs> Do you want to stay with the microphone Hello. and you can answer it from there? I think it should be turned on. Is it turned on? All yeah. right, okay. Um, you mentioned Costa Rica, which is uh, quite interesting because I worked in countries around Costa Rica where they had a residual value to each, each item that you would buy. So, for example, um, egg cartons, um, plastic bottles, um, Coca-Cola uh, glass bottles, you would not throw them away. You would keep them. The next time you go to the supermarket, there was a kiosk where you drop in those items in. They give you a, a receipt with a value which you can exchange. So, really, in theory, you only pay once unless you pay more or you buy more. Now, I was thinking that wouldn't that be a good idea if we had residual value to each item we buy? So people know that if you ever take that back at the end, you get 10%, but you only pay once. So you have like everybody just has an account and you just buy something and then you take it back. That way you would reduce the number of um, collection points because everybody's taking them to one area to, to re uh, recycle. You create employment because you have people sorting out these things where, where they are continuously brought back. And you don't have the, the funny system where you have different bins at your home, but the, the, the truck from the council is only one, and it puts everything back in the same bin again. So you are separating that. So you, you don't have to separate items by someone else. You've already done it yourself. So. Um Deposit return schemes, we call them here, they're coming back in. So legislation's been passed. The government's not being very help fast. The government's not being very fast in implementing the things that are in legislation that they pass back at the tail end of 21. So it will come in for drinks. Um, it will come in for drinks cartons, plastic bottles and cans only, not glass. Uh, that will happen next year. And... Then not in, we're not entirely sure quite how it will work, probably reverse vending machines. Interestingly, we did trial reverse vending machines here. I think it was Tesco who did it. And the machine looked at the weight of what you put in, and people kept putting in full bottles to get more money back. So they had to abandon it. So I don't know if that's a particularly British trait to try and fit all the machines. So they're working around that one this time. Um, they think the biggest impact will be on litter because a lot of drinks cartons get littered. But we will see more schemes, I think, like that coming back in. And if you're in Devon or Somerset and you do separate it, it stays separated on the vehicles across the two counties, apart from Exeter, which is changing. Again, the legislation is changing around that. Cool. Thank you very much. Um, Next one. Yep. Thank you. I used to be the highlight of my week as a kid, going down with the Corona bottles, actually. Yeah. Get a bit of pocket money. Um, I was just wondering about uh, waste. You mentioned QR codes on bins. Is there any move to put QR codes on waste bags? Because then it's really easy to identify. If you're sharing a bin with someone, it's really difficult to measure your waste, as we're all trying to do our carbon footprint. But if there was a move to put a QR, and we knew as a customer, this is, these are our bags, this is the way we do it, you can measure it exactly. Feels like a loaded question. We're running our first trial in about 10 days. One of the emails I sent this morning is booking in the slot. So we have QR codes, but we've got some hardware that we're going to be putting on bins, and we're trying to incorporate that against sacks with barcodes, wearables for cleaners, take away the manual element. So actually, give me a fortnight, and I'll let you know how the trial's gone. <laughs> I didn't plant him. <laughs> I'm, I'm not convinced. Yeah. <laughs> Any, we've got time probably for one more question, if there is one. Anybody? Yeah, there you go. Well done, thank you. Yeah, Hi, do you want me to um, running? Lex from Blue Goose Coffee. Uh, we've 
crossed paths quite a few times in the past, but uh, your talk reminds me that we've really got to talk. Um, so in our own small way, because we're a micro business, um, we are working with our hospitality clients, delivering bean, coffee beans into uh, in plastic free bags. And then every time I deliver, I, I bring those back. We work with Envar in Cambridge, the com composting, commercial composting operation. Um, one of our challenges is, is the compostable coffee capsules go out direct to consumer, so they go across the UK. I've always loved the, the idea of a uh, prepaid postage that either takes them to Envar or, or whatever site it might be. So we'd, we can you know, obviously do as much as we can if people aren't composting them on at home or going into food waste, etc. Um, do you, if I was a customer of, of yours, I'd obviously, we, we'd talk through the system and, and you'd work through it. Do you provide kind of consultancy as well so that I could, basically as a small business, I'm doing all the thinking and I'm trying to run the business and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, so I'd love to work with you for some of the stuff that we do, but also just to, to talk through the challenges I've got as a small business and there's obviously cost implications. So yeah, that's the kind of question is, Obviously, you're a business and commercial entity, but... Keep planting these questions, eh? <laughs> yes. Yeah, most of our consultancy works in London because we don't tend to service that many sites in London because we're leaving that city till last. Um, but yes, happily. And I had a conversation with um, Fiona Charmley, who's one of the professors who runs the Circular Economy Hub at the university, because we have lots of waste data now. And one of the problems down in this region is that a lot of the recycling, reprocessing infrastructure is where our heavy end industry used to be. So it's in the Midlands and it's up north and it's not down here. But I think there's a strong argument for actually developing more infrastructure down here. If you look at the waste data flows, so I had a conversation with her about is there something we can do to start pulling this waste data together. So Compostable packaging is the big one because it isn't composted in the southwest. The nearest facility is Reading. And yet, we have so many customers who use it. And I think we have some good data on that. And if we could persuade the university, because they've got bigger brains than us and budgets, budget, importantly, <laughs> I think there's a really strong argument. And I think then the investment will come if people see how much of this stuff is floating around. And not just compostable packaging, but there will be other materials as well. So, yes, call out to anybody who might work at the university who wants to go, come on, let's get some of these projects going and invest in the infrastructure because that will bring jobs as well. You know, it's high-tech jobs. Yeah, definitely. And I absolutely second that, the, the university contact in there as well. Again, the innovation projects that I was talking about earlier, it provides you that really easy way in to do a little bit of feasibility research, proof of concept kind of stuff. And then you work with guys like, um, you know, with Ryan and... Fiona and you know those people and, and they will find ways and means of making things work for you. Um, there's also the Entrepreneurship um, Society which is a group, just a group of students. There's the I Keep projects as well. Um, I Keep projects are brilliant. I actually ran one at Digilab. Um, we had two this last year. One of them was sponsored by IBM. One of them was, um, was it IBM? Yeah it was IBM. Um, and the other one, uh, that, you know, they're, they're free projects get involved, get, get hold of whoever the, the IPDM is, the Impact and Partnership Development Manager for the uni, and they can kind of work out where your best routes are um, and start setting up. And eventually you end up in that space where you're involved in, you know, a massive consortium, potentially for 10 million pounds or something like that, you know, with a load of partners, and you set up the, the circular economy hubs, you know. So, but it, it starts small, and I would, you know, and can grow organically, so definitely get in touch. I should get off my uni soapbox, shouldn't I? <laughs> Thank you, Philippa, that was brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, shall I grab that one back? Thank you very much. I'll keep hold of that. Um, so last bits from me then. Thank you all very, very much for coming. I really hope that it's been a useful um, morning for you. You've still got lots of day left to actually go and do some work as well, which is fantastic with all these new ideas buzzing around your head and deciding you're going to go on the carbon, uh, the carbon calculator, you know, all of these things that you've, and, and come and talk to the university, talk to each other. We've got a networking session again now. Um, so if you can stay for that, that would be absolutely brilliant. Um, more than happy to talk to anybody who needs to pick up on some of the stuff that I've been saying as well. Um, all emails and the slides will be circulated later. Please join Exist. Please join the Exeter Chamber. Um, you know, we're here for you guys. It's, this is, I mean, and I'm saying this 
as one of the Exeter Chamber as well. Uh, it's brilliant. It's a really, really good network um, to to find out all sorts of new stuff that you don't know. And I say, come to things like this. Um, I would like to say thank you to our sponsors who are on the screen behind me. So Bitpod, who Alex is at the back and he's been doing all the... the um, slightly tricky today <laughs> audio official um, but thank you very much and the live stream will be up um will be available sorry the the the, the copy of the live stream i don't know what you call it um is going to be available shortly um so anybody can come and, and look at that um university of exeter obviously nat west as i said one of our newest sponsors um thompson jenna chartered accountants chartered accountants exeter science park which is why we've got the the space here today um, and Mitchell Moores. So thank you all to our sponsors very much. Thank you to the team who are behind this. Um, so One Voice PR, sorry, and they're on there as well, aren't they? Um, One Voice PR and um, agency. Um, Cloda Murphy from Cathedral Appointments. Um, and Katie, who's come in with One Voice. I think that's all of us. Oh, Colin Dart. Colin Dart's on there. He's Set Squared. So uh, Set Squared. Um, link to them who are upstairs and doing a big water session today, I think. Um, we're all around. Come and talk to us whenever you like. Thank you so much for coming. Okay.